whole world can raise back to the gold days. Shouting out the latest ways when I spit the phrase that pays. It's G power, G power, G power, G power. You got G power. It was 2005, and a group of Lionhead employees were goofing around in a local park. Armed with a video camera borrowed from work and about 50 pounds worth of props, they were there to film a spoof kung fu movie. Why? No particular reason. They were bored, and it seemed a decent way to spend a weekend. Oh, and the bottle of whiskey they brought along probably helped, too. Why on earth am I showing you this footage, you may well be asking, and what could it possibly have to do with steam? Well, believe it or not, between the bald caps and the smoke bombs and the lack of cultural sensitivity, an idea was forming for a game that would impress Valve so much, they'd jump at the chance to be the ones selling it to the world. This is the story of Ragdoll Kung Fu. Now, amongst this group of drunk game developers pretending to do martial arts, I want to focus on one person in particular. It's the lead character, of course, played by a Lionhead artist called Mark Healy, who you might know better today as one of the co-founders of Media Molecule, the creators of Little Big Planet, Tearaway, and the upcoming Dreams. Yeah, he's come quite a long way. Although most of his career up until this point had seen Healy work on games like Fable, Black and White, and Theme Park as an artist, he'd actually started off in the industry as a programmer and never quite got rid of that itch. So when another Lionhead developer shuts down his idea for a simulated town in a project they're both working on, claiming it'd be too much work, too much hassle, Healy gets a bit cross and decides he's going to prove a point. He goes home that evening, begins learning C++, and returns at some point later with a functioning prototype to show that yes, actually, it could be done after all. If Healy had hoped that this would scratch his programming itch and that that would, that would be enough for now, well then, of course, he was wrong. It was back worse than ever, and so he realises he's going to need himself a side project, something outside of the day job. He starts with a simple fighting game, which he figures he'll be able to both code and do the artwork for. Oh, okay, right, so it's a fighting game. That's why I showed you the spoof kung fu film earlier on. Maybe that's where Healy got his idea. Well, sort of, but not quite. Not realising at the time that this simple fighting game would one day be played by tens of thousands of people and lead the way on this new, definitive PC gaming platform, Healy thinks to himself, you know what, if I made it a kung fu fighting game, I could use, and this is in his words, that stupid film I made for the cutscenes. Yeah, these clips you're seeing, they play between each of the game's levels. They used to tell its story to provide motivation for the player. And I am in awe of the fact that any of it exists. This, this scene right here, for example, features two future Media Molecule co-founders fighting each other while a couple of people are walking their dog in the background. Although it wasn't officially a Lionhead project, other developers at the studio were interested to see what Healy was working on. So occasionally, he'd bring his laptop with him into work and just have people play around with the game and see what they think. He remembers the turning point for the game's design happening during one of these playtests. Another of his future co-founders, Alex Evans, is taking a look at the game with its 2D sprites and its platforms when he says, you could try adding some ropes for characters to, you know, grab onto when they jump. And so writes a bit of code to simulate the rope's physics and leaves that with his friend. Healy takes that code and instead applies it directly to the characters themselves. It's his eureka moment. Suddenly everything about the game changes. It's no longer just a kung fu game, it's a ragdoll kung fu game. To move characters around, you now need to literally pick up their foot and then place it in front of the other one, or alternatively, grab a limb and just chuck them in the direction of your choosing. There were no pre-scripted animations, no predefined combos, everything was down to the player and their mouse, or indeed, players. You could plug eight mice into a PC at the same time and have them all taking part at once. This game was unlike anything else out there. Which is exactly what the Lionhead community thought when news of Ragdoll Kung Fu was posted on the studio's official site. Amazingly, despite this being a personal side project, Healy had the full backing of his entire team, including Lionhead boss Peter Molyneux, who even went as far as writing a letter to say that his company owned no part of this game. It was all Mark's. They just wanted to help where they could. 
And they really had, whether they realised it at the time or not. That post on the Lionhead site had a lot of people talking about this game with its sense of humour and its bizarre control scheme. Out of the blue, Healy receives an email from game designer Jonathan Blow, who just started work on Braid, inviting him to something called the Experimental Gameplay Workshop at that year's Game Developers Conference. I had no clue what that was. I'd never even been to GDC. I didn't know what that was either. So I thought, okay, I'll go along. In my head, it was like a room like this. Yeah. But with a couple of people in that showing some, you know, ridiculous ideas to each other or something. So I didn't even prepare for it or anything. I just took my laptop with a copy of the game on. And then I turned up and I looked in the room and it was this massive room. He's, you know, probably hold about three or four hundred people. <laughs> Terrified, Healy does his best to talk his way through a demo of the game. And again, another surprise here. It goes down really really well. He was the star of the show, his enthusiasm was clear, his game was innovative, and so importantly, he had everyone in the room laughing a lot. And there were three people in that audience who were really worth impressing. Doug Wood, Scott Dalton, and Robin Walker of Valve Corporation. Here's a quote from Wood at the time. The response was amazing. By the end, it was a standing ovation. It had such an impact on us that, without saying anything amongst ourselves, all three others immediately proceeded to approach Mark as he was packing stuff away. Everyone unanimously and simultaneously agreed to pounce on this guy. Because of course, they had something to pitch him. Steam. And again, I, you know, I live in a, quite a bubble. Although I've worked in the games industry all my life, I don't really pay much attention to it, if you know what I mean. I don't really know sure. what's what and who's who. And so um, these people came up and said, oh yeah, we're, you know, we're interested in, we'd be interested in putting this on Steam because we're, you know, we're changing the service to have third party titles and things. And Alex was with me at the time and he had to explain to me what Steam was. <laughs> and, you know, and they were like, if you could come to Seattle tomorrow to meet Gabe Newell, then we let's talk about it. And I'm oh like, God. That's all cool. And Alex was like, do you know who Gabe Newell is? And I'm like, no, 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 I've got to explain to who he was. So I was just like, fuck, okay. So Healy jumps on a plane to Seattle where he immediately loses his wallet and then is left with a rather embarrassing task of arriving at Valve and saying, hello, I'm here to show you my game. Also, can I borrow some money, please? Only till I get home. They say yes, thankfully, before giving him a tour of their office setup, which is extremely impressive even then. At some point during this tour, he's introduced to Valve President Gabe Newell, who Healy describes as quite an eccentric character, and he goes on to show him the same demo that had gone down so well at GDC, and of course, Gabe loves it, just like everyone else. Healy is then immediately offered $10,000 as an advance if Valve can sell Ragdoll Kung Fu on his behalf through Steam. Bearing in mind that Healy had only really discovered what Steam was the day before this, he figured, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good deal, and happily signs up. He heads home, somewhat overwhelmed by just how successful his surprise trip to the States has turned out, and gets to work finishing the game that maybe isn't so much of a side project anymore. In October of 2005, it launches, and Healy remembers a conference call with Valve on the same day in which he's told that the pre-orders alone have already covered his advance. The coolest part of the story for me really is that by doing that I, I was sort of exposed to a side of game dev that I'd never seen before. So it's like a bit of a crash course in running a games company really as opposed to just being an artist or a programmer. Yeah, yeah. And it was that that sort of gave me the confidence to you know go off with Alex and Dave and Kareem to start Media Molecule really. So. Do you think Media Molecule would have happened without Ragdoll Kung Fu? Or would it have uh, looked a lot different? Yeah, I don't know. I think it, in, in my mind, it's, it's, it, they are intrinsically linked. Playing Ragdoll Kung Fu in 2018 is sort of a bit weird, to be honest. It hasn't aged particularly well, I don't think. The controls are interesting, sure, but most of the time they actually feel kind of clumsy to use. And although I'm amazed that any of these bizarre cutscenes exist in the first place, I do feel that those jokes must have landed a lot better 13 years ago than they do today. And yet, Underneath it all, impossibly, you can see the very same DNA that would one day find its way into Little Big Planet, the most wholesome of platformers. Ragdoll physics, and importantly the emphasis on character customization, that's exactly what would convince Sony to fund the team's new PlayStation exclusive as they started out on their own the very next year. Although here's one final bit of trivia, that almost didn't happen, Healy told me. Seeing their passion for user-created content, Valve offered almost all of the Media Molecule founders a job, suggesting Gary's mod 
as something they might like to work on. Imagine that. Well, you know what? They could just start their own team and make something entirely different. It was all up for grabs, really desks and all. As for Steam, while well, the gates had now been opened to third-party games, and they would keep on coming. At first, it was a trickle, with Darwinia arriving later that year, followed by the occasional hand-picked title. And then in 2007, companies like id Software, IDOS Interactive, and Capcom began distributing their games through Steam, rather than trying to compete by their own digital marketplaces. Before long, Steam had become the place to buy and play PC games, and eventually, in 2012, Valve would decide to move away from their role as curators, introducing a service called Steam Greenlight, which handed the same responsibility over to the users themselves. Today, it's even more straightforward than that. If you want to sell your game on Steam, you simply need to pay the application fee, fill out the paperwork, and Valve will check that what you're selling is, and I quote, configured correctly, matches the description provided on the store page, and does not contain any malicious content. That's it. If you meet those three criteria, you're in. As a result, what we've got now is just a very different kind of platform. Something like 21 games were added to Steam every single day throughout 2017. That's more than 7,600 games across the entire year. But there was once a time when Valve would come to you, fighting their way across a crowded GDC hall because you'd made a game they wanted to sell to the world. Yeah, yeah. How oh, Thank you so much for watching this first episode of People Make Games. It's only been possible thanks to the generous support of viewers that have funded our work through Patreon, and you can see some of their names on screen right now. It's not an overstatement to say that over the last couple of weeks, you've completely changed our lives. So, yeah, cheers for that. And also thanks to Eurogamer, I already miss you a lot terribly, and the loading bar for supporting us right from the get-go. Let us know what you think of this story of Ragdoll Kung Fu, and we'll see you again real soon. Goodbye. Learn about the techniques that's been around forever. The one true system got to bring the show together.